Hello, and welcome to episode 563 of the official EstablishTheRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan, and today I'm joined by two of the most thoughtful, insightful, no sex having best ball grinders on the planet. It is our own best ball mania champ, best ball mania one champ, Justin Herzig, and Michael Leone. You know him, King Virgin, leader of our newly founded analytics full blown department, and author of the best ball manifesto, which we'll get into through this series. Leone, how's it going today? Pretty good. I get like two weeks a year to have sex, and this year I decided to just write the manifesto. So <laughs> I just abstained year round this time. Ah. Herzig, good afternoon. I mean, I'm not far behind you. I used to only think best fall was just a couple months out of the year. Now it's turning into an annual thing, and uh, now my wife becomes like a couple months out of the year or something. Yes. No. Best ball is 24 7 365 these days and that is why this is the first of a six-part summer of best ball series in this series which is designed to give you everything that you need to get a base level of knowledge and some advanced knowledge as well to compete in the crazy big best ball contest all summer this series is going to cover strategy for each of the four biggest best ball sites we'll also discuss what to think about when you're on the clock and we'll end with some advanced and counterintuitive strategies Reminder that for our micro takes, our player takes, those flow through to the rankings that are part of DraftKit Pro. In that DraftKit Pro, we do have continuously updating rankings for every best ball format. You can upload rankings on most sites, our rankings on most sites, directly into the platform helps a ton. And then we also have a ton of context around those rankings as well. Head to the subscribe tab on establishrun.com for more details on DraftKit Pro. It is $49.99. On today's show, we're going to cover what to think about when you are on the clock in a best ball draft, which sounds really simple, but I didn't realize that I had to get into arguments with hundreds of best ball bros about this, which stemmed a tweet, which stemmed an article, which stemmed a bunch of argument in Slack. Apparently, it's not as simple as I thought it was what to think about when you're on the clock. Because if you're new to this, if you're new to best ball and you log on to Twitter, all you would think about Oh, I'm going to try best ball for the first time. Let me see what the people on Twitter say. Oh, they say that all that matters is week 17. Don't even think about anything else. Just get week 17 stacks. They would say rookies, Adam, you take rookies 20 spots ahead of ADP. Best ball strategy 101, you're printing. Oh, Adam, 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 wide receivers with every pick. That That's that's what you should do in best ball. That is not what you should be thinking about when you're on the clock, in my opinion. And I, I know, and look, the biggest edge, I think, and a, I, a lot of this is knowing where your edge is, right? Personally, me, Adam, I think my edge is in player takes. I do not think that should be everyone's edge. So like last year, I won the DraftKings $333 buy-in best ball tournament. The reason I won was I got Daniel Jones in the 11th round. I got Trevor Lawrence in the 10th round. I had Saquon Barkley in round two, Ramondre in round eight, Jalen Waddle. we were really high on. I got him in round four, Godwin in round five, Devontae Smith in round six. T. Higgins in round three, Zay Jones in round 15. And these were not random. Oh, these were guys that I actually liked. And when I play some of these high stakes stuff, I go for it more with my micro player takes. These guys, Justin and Mike, think about it way, way, way differently where their actual edge is. So, Justin, you can retort and reply here. I want to get into some more pyramid stuff when you're on the clock, but just you can retort to me because I know that player takes is not where everyone's edge is or what they should be trying to do. Yeah. And I mean, hey, player takes, it's one of the pillars of the pyramid. It is definitely important because to be honest, it's actually the most important thing if you're able to get it right. For example, if you were to draft a whole bunch of Josh Jacobs last year, you could have had horrible roster construction, no stacks, any other stuff. It doesn't matter. Like if you just had a ton of Josh Jacobs, you were probably doing pretty well. The challenge is it's also the thing that is most difficult to predict going forward. So even though, yes, we want to get it right, I mean, there's ways to how do we kind of most accurately, even if it's not our specialty, because you're right for you, this is probably one of your strengths. But I think probably only a couple percent of people can really say they have a projectable edge for player takes. But if you're subscribed to ETR, if you're using ranks that are regularly updated, if you're either paying attention to the news or paying attention to people that are paying attention to the news, those are ways to make sure that you're at least getting 80% of the way, 90% of the way there. But yes, player takes, again, that's like middle of the pyramid. There's other things we need to be accounting for when we're on the clock. Yeah, and a lot of these edges that we'll talk about are, I think, kind of smallish. The biggest edge you can get is just being right on players. Now, I totally understand and agree that is very, very difficult to do. Leone, any more top-level stuff before we get into the actual 
when you're on the clock pyramid here? Yeah, I think some of it comes down to, to like what you can control and what you can't control. So you see a lot of the week 17 stuff on Twitter and that's because that's something that's somewhat controllable at the time of the draft. If you get those stacks and we're going to get into specific formats and how to draft for those, but it depends on your payout structure, right? Like if you're in a tournament that's super top heavy week 17, you do want to approach it more of like a DFS mindset and what you need to win that week 17, even though it seems crazy to do so because so many things have to happen for you to get there. Ultimately your expected value is heavily shaped by that. Um, but yeah, what Justin said with player takes, like someone like you, Adam, is really good at it, but other people, that might not be something that's super controllable for them to get on the right players, in which case they may want to focus more on getting some ADP value at the time of their draft, making sure their positional allocation is correct and, and setting up correlation in smart, simple ways without having to make it real complicated. Right, for sure. Totally agree. Okay, if you have DraftKit Pro, hopefully you've read Herzig's On The Clock article. We're going to put some context, some more context around that article now and basically the idea of justin's article stemmed from the tweet that i sent with the help of leone and herzig about what i think about when i'm on the clock the first thing that i like to think about especially as you move along in the draft is roster construction and that is what justin has at the bottom i would define roster construction as understanding how many players at a certain position you should take and also waiting in there when you take them Justin, I would agree that if people are out here taking four quarterbacks or a whole bunch of tight ends in certain formats and stuff like that, that that is a negative EV way to go about roster construction. And that's like really controllable from the start table stakes at this point. How would you talk about roster construction to maybe um, someone who doesn't have their head fully around them? Yeah. And roster construction is something that is not in itself going to win you any tournaments. But what it can do is definitely lose you it. And so when I think of roster construction, it kind of is similar to guardrails where, hey, we want to make sure that we are not working outside of there and coming up with lineups that just have inevitably poor advance rates. Two examples are some people are like, I'm going to only draft Kelsey. I'm going to only stick with this one tight end. Well, historically, we have seen that one tight end, even when Kelsey has an amazing season and such a great gap amongst the others, like still doesn't have great advance rates. And then you think from a playoff structure, if you only have one tight end or one QB, that player needs to have a great season, needs to keep advancing. And now you're not going to be unique in the week 17 anyways. So that's an example where I do not want to have a one QB or a one tight end build. There's other extremes that you reference. Uh, in, in the article, we linked to TJ Hernandez, who did some great analysis on this that showed like, hey, the advance rates for the previous three years, there's a good amount that you can kind of find yourself into it's the ones that consistently year over year over year have bad advance rates that we really want to stay away from yeah one that i think is interesting leone i thought three running backs were viable and the general parameters at least on underdog which is 18 round drafts we have is two to three quarterbacks four to seven running backs seven to nine wide receivers two to three tight ends those numbers should vary based on uh when you take a player in other words if you draft travis kelsey you should only have one other tight end likely late Although there, I've seen some disagreement on that out there. I would not have three tight end rosters with Kelsey, I guess is what I'm trying to get at. But I did think that three running back rosters were viable. I know you did a bunch of research on this stuff. Leone, anything you want to point out that you found on roster construction? Yeah, I did draft one three running back team early on in the underdog format, Best Ball Mania 4. But in general... But the hard part about drafting three running backs is you would need to draft them all pretty early to justify that. And then the way the wide receiver ADPs are right now, you're probably going to be too weak at wide receiver. But like what you said, it really kind of matters the draft capital that you put into the position. So if you're drafting running backs early, you're going to take less of them in total. If you're not drafting running backs early, you're going to take more of them. And the kind of the golden rule for running backs is you can draft them early. You can draft a lot of them, but you can't do both at the same time. Or you're just going to overspend at the running back position. And you mentioned, Adam, like if you took Kelsey early, you're probably only going to take two tight ends. That's because we really want to maximize the advantage, assume certain things go right when we're drafting. So mm -hmm. if we're taking Kelsey, part of the advantage of that is not just getting Kelsey's points, but the fact that we can devote an extra roster spot to either running back or wide receiver because we don't need the, the safety of the, or the backstop of having a third tight end since we can depend on Kelsey. And just honestly, just uh, you know, take an L if Kelsey has a horrible season or gets hurt. You know, you're yeah. probably not going to win anyways if that happens. So why, you know, draft to try and back that up the next level of the on the clock pyramid 
that Justin has here is stacking. And this is not week 17 stacking. We are referring to straight up stacking, pairing quarterback with pass catcher or pass catching and or pass catching running back. This is one, whereas I kind of poo poo the week 17 stuff, I am all in on stacking all of my quarterbacks because that helps me advance in the regular season. That helps me advance in week 15. That helps me advance in week 16. It doesn't just help me in week 17. And also just from like a high level perspective, think about it like this. I took Trevor Lawrence last year. uh, I think it was like round 10 or 11 of my team that ended up winning. I didn't really like Zay Jones, but it got to me in round 15. And I was like, well, I'm betting on Trevor Lawrence having a pretty good year or a great year anyways. Let me take a shot on Zay Jones here. I stacked Zay Jones. I ended up with a share of Zay Jones, but I would not have gotten anyways. Obviously, Zay Jones goes on to outperform his ADP massively and be a huge key to me winning. So to me, stacking is like incredibly, incredibly important. I'm not sure that for smaller field stuff, it's as important to like get premium stacks. I don't mind having backdoor stacks, having some secondary wide receiver stacks, et cetera, et cetera, late. But anyways, Justin, anything more to add here? on stacking as a pillar of what we think about we're on the clock remember the first thing we're thinking about is roster construction second thing we're thinking about here is stacking yeah each year i become more and more of a proponent of stacking in best ball um and i think a lot of the reasons that you referenced but at the end of the day we are making bets on a specific team that increases our correlation and it decreases how many things we need to actually get right and when a team and higher offense is doing well the passing game is doing well Everyone eats together. Rising tide lifts all ships, and that'll help you with advance rates. Then we get to the playoffs. This now becomes three uncorrelated weekly DFS tournaments. And for you to win a DFS tournament, you all know you want to stack your QB, your wide receiver. We mentioned the running back aspect. I am a proponent of stacking running backs as well, even if it isn't a pass catching, because again, you're betting on that offense. That offense as a whole does well. That running back also probably does well, so it helps your advance rate. Now come playoff time, you do have 18 players on your team. So it's not like in DFS where you need every single player each week to go off. You can have kind of some ping pong, some back and forth. And maybe you have Damian Harris gets you three touchdowns in week 16. And most of the Josh Allen, Stephon Diggs teams end up falling out. But then week 17, Damian Harris doesn't do well. But Josh Allen and Diggs do. And you've got a unique team in that championship. So for me, I'm thinking I want to stack that entire team. And yes, this is the second part of the pyramid because it really is that important. When we talk about ADP and player takes and positional capital and all of these, for me, I'm willing to give up a little of those things if I'm stacking appropriately. Yeah, I think this is one we actually are all in agreement on, Leona. Even the data is in agreement on on this one, right? Go ahead on stacking. I mean, Justin broke it down perfectly because it's a combination of season-long correlation with the spike weeks. I love how he compared it to DFS where I think sometimes people are afraid of like, double stacks like T Higgins and Jamar Chase, because like, what are the chances they both go off in the playoffs? And like Justin said, well, unlike in DFS, if Chase has the alpha game, we don't have to use T Higgins as score. So I think that's important to know. And in general for stacking to me, if I ever get to the point where I'm on the clock and it's a position roughly of need for me, and it's at ADP or after the stack partner, I'm just taking that stack partner almost pretty blindly because yeah. you'd really have to have so much confidence in your player takes to just say, hey, I'm not going to take an ADP value here. I'm not going to take something that's correlated. Um, and I, oh, one last thing, uh, the data that I looked at, you kind of want to try and stack each of your quarterbacks if you can. It gives you multiple outs for spike weeks, especially if you're in a tournament like Best Ball Mania where you have uncorrelated three playoff weeks in a row. So I like to stack like, one to three skill players with each of my quarterbacks if possible. Yeah, for sure. And one, and just Go ahead, Justin. One thing I'll throw on top of that one to three is if we are drafting and stacking T. Higgins and Jamar Chase, drafting stacking those two is very different than if you have Daniel Jones and you're stacking Wando Robinson and, and Hyatt. Because in that situation, I'm more willing to also maybe go grab Darius Slayton, maybe also even grab another, um, you know, who, maybe Isaiah Hodgins. Because from a draft capital standpoint, if Daniel Jones has that great passing year, it's a lot easier for those late wide receivers, those late pass catchers to really beat their ADP and all be values, or at least some of them be really good values versus if you're already saying, hey, my first and second rounder with Chase and Higgins, you really need those to have elite, highly concentrated offensive seasons. Uh, So I'm less likely to kind of go deep into the stack if I'm devoting early capital. All right. 
the next spot on the pyramid is ADP, average draft position. Now, the reason this is important, and Leonia has done a ton of work on this, is because essentially wisdom of the crowds, we think ADPs are relatively efficient. When you have an opportunity to get a guy way past his ADP, it is proven to be profitable. My response is this time of year, I don't know how efficient the ADPs are. Right, I like Alexander Madison was being drafted like four rounds too late until I had to go nuts on it on on Twitter. Right, so like I don't think the ADPs this time of year are that efficient. The ADPs come August and September on sharp sites that have a lot of liquidity. I would agree. Like underdog last year in September, I thought the ADPs were very very in line with what they should be. So, anyways, Leone, you have the floor here. I know you've gone full nerd on ADP and how it affects outcomes. Go ahead. Yeah, I think part of it, too, is you just want to be somewhat attached to the market that you're drafting in. Like there's a diminishing point of returns if you're way different. And um, even if ADP isn't super efficient this time of year, I think you want to take it into account. But again, ADP is the most objective metric that we have. I would say use some combination of ADP and the ETR rankings, which really like Alexander Madison, in which case you would be taking him ahead of ADP just by not as much as we would if we didn't bake ADP in. And the other aspect to this, too, is you're more likely, let's say like you have Madison ahead of uh, Joe Mixon, you know, at, at one point in the draft. But if you take Joe Mixon first, you still can get Madison coming back. And that's what you kind of want to do is build these really big super teams. In general, when I'm on the clock, other things I'm thinking about in terms of ADP value is like not just compare. If I'm on the clock at pick, you know, 50, I'm not just looking at a wide receiver as an ADP of 55 and looking at like the value I'm giving up, but also relative to maybe there's a wide receiver available with ADP of 42. So instead of comparing both of those players to the pick I'm at, comparing them to one another if I'm between the two, because if I'm taking that wide receiver at pick with an ADP of 55, I'm not giving up five spots of ADP value because I'm picking up a, a pick 50. I'm giving up a full round of ADP value because I could have picked a wide receiver with an ADP of 42. But again, you do want to bake in the player takes and our – ETR rankings on all these best ball sites do bake that. And I honestly bake it in even a little bit more than our default rankings do more of like a 50, 50 type of thing. There are a bunch of uh, sections that go deeper on this in Leone's best ball manifesto. One of the distinctions he makes is real time ADP versus closing ADP. I go for closing ADP as like a priority. I think Ramondre Stevenson is going to finish in September. To, this is last year, you know, two or three rounds higher than I was drafting him in June or July. That is an absolute smash to me. But what Leone is saying is that real-time ADP, aka what the ADP is in the app at the time you're actually drafting, getting value there also makes a difference, yep. you know. And, but for me, I go out of my way to try to think about players who will be drafted higher come September, and that's closing and this, ADP. This might be a stupid point, and that might seem obvious, but like – your real-time ADP value is correlated to your closing line ADP value. So even if you're right on Ramondre Stevenson going up two to three rounds, um, if you take him a round ahead of ADP each yeah. time, you're capping yourself at one to two rounds of an ADP value gain. If you're drafting him at ADP or closer to ADP and you get that closing line ADP value, all of a sudden that goes to like three rounds of ADP value. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And I think one thing to mention, it's what Leone said earlier on about uh, things we can control we can control with confidence if we're getting ADP value in this draft, because I can see literally I'm getting six picks of ADP value, one round of ADP value with this pick. So take that, put it in your bank, kind of, hey, that's great. Now we're hoping that we can also get closing line value as well. When you combine them, great. But again, Levitan's talking about like, hey, he loves the Ramondre. He loved the Godwin last year. He loved the Latavius this year because he's on sharp of things. And it's easy to kind of pick point these occasional examples. But for the majority of players and the majority of all of us drafting, focus on, hey, those things you can control. If you see ADP real-time value now, now, you know you can lock that in. Yes, let's also look for the closing line too. Yeah. One, sure. one final thing on that is – getting spots of ADP value early in the draft is worth a lot more than later in the draft because those picks are at a premium. So getting someone with an ADP of 48 at pick 55 is, is pretty meaningful. Uh, once you get into like the 150s and the 180s, three rounds of ADP value doesn't even really matter that much. And that is especially important to keep in mind with the correlation thing that we talked about in terms of stacking. Yeah, for sure. And Leone's best ball manifesto is up on the site. You can get 
way more nerded out on this stuff if you read uh, if you read the manifesto. At the top of the pyramid here, we have ad roster construction. We've had stacking. We've had ADP. The last, the next couple are player takes, which we already talked about, and positional capital, which we already mentioned. Also, I don't want to rehash the whole thing here, Justin, but player takes and positional capital, what do you think the people need to know? Yeah, I mean, player takes, I think we really touched on it. At the end of the day, if you've got takes, it's a lot easier to, um, I will say, it's a lot easier to fade a player successfully than actually be above market on a player. So if you do have a player that you fade, you see something, feel free to avoid that player. Odell Beckham, easy example this year. I'm probably going to end up with 0% of him other than maybe Lamar Stacks or something. Um, but player takes, most number one is just get rankings, follow the rankings, upload the rankings regularly, pay attention to the news or follow the people like Levitin that are paying attention to the news for you. Um, that's an easy one. Yeah. Positional let, let, me, let me just, let me yeah, just jump yeah. in there real quick before you, before you move on. I, I just wanted to say that the fade is always easier because most football players get hurt, fail. I mean, there's very, there's way more downside outcomes than positive outcomes, especially at the top of the draft. So like, you know, last year, like Michael Thomas, Debo Samuel were to me examples of like really, really easy fades, but I was likely to be right there anyways, because most players end out failing. So, so anyways, I totally agree with Justin that it's way easier to, to fade a guy than it is to like pinpoint a guy who's going to go off. But anyways, go ahead, Justin. Yeah, no, I love that. And for me last year it was Justin Herbert. And it's not so much that I hated Justin Herbert, but it was, he was getting drafted right next to Lamar Jackson and Jalen Hurts. And from a draft profile, those others had much far higher upsides and ability to get there with their legs. And so I was comfortable saying, I'm willing to give up Justin Herbert because even if he hits his top percent of outcome, I can even exceed that. And there's a more likely chance I hit it with those other QBs. Yeah. Positional capital. This one is probably the most nuanced. This is the one that I think it's most important to read Leone's manifesto here. But it also is it's difficult, but it's still very important. And thinking through as you're drafting, we need to a we need to think about we don't want to devote too much capital to various position groups. Think of it like a draft. Oh, Leone, I'll leave you that one because I know you talked about that, uh, that one very well. Um, but before we get to that, I think as well, as your team tells a story, as you think about what needs to happen, you're drafting like you're right. You're devoting the right amount of capital to various positions and stuff. This is where we really consider what does the draft board look like this year? The more you draft, you're going to get a feel for where you like drafting positions and where you like fading positions. For me personally, I think the positions, the ADPs of around 90 to 140 are wide receivers that I really just do not like. And because I don't like those, that pretty much has a major impact on how I'm drafting everywhere else because if I get to pick 90 and I don't have a certain amount of wide receivers, I'm now either overspending on an area I don't love or I'm waiting way longer and hoping I can find value after 140. So from positional capital, that leads me in this situation to maybe be drafting wide receivers earlier. Running backs, tight ends, QBs, everyone, you're going to have your own feel for it but it's important to get that feel, figure out where there are. I like to call them, we know the dead zones, but also opportunity zones. Where are the areas I really want to be targeting players for a certain position and making sure your entire lineup tells a balanced story about uh, around different positional capital. Go ahead, Leone, if you have anything to add there. Yeah, uh, I've talked with like Pat Crane, who won Best Ball Mania 3 about this, and he kind of took my Best Ball Manifesto point where I converted each draft pick to draft capital. And he's thinking that it's like, if anyone here has done an auction draft, you have a certain amount of auction dollars that you can spend. And in general, you want to spend a certain amount of dollars on running back, wide receiver, tight end. And that's sort of what we're doing in, with each pick, you know? So if you take Saquon Barkley in round two, that's going to be a lot of auction dollars off your running back budget versus if your first running backs and, you know, Joe Mixon in round six, that's going to be less budget. So keep that in mind. Uh, when you're when you're doing that and you just don't want to reach a point of diminishing returns at a position where you know you've drafted a lot right and or you've drafted a lot early so then if the late guys even hit like how often are they even contributing right. unless your early guys fail I know for me like reviewing drafts after I'm done is pretty helpful and I've spotted you know mine a couple weaknesses where I've drafted wide receiver heavy early and I've been reluctant to stop at like seven um, just because historically I like to get a lot of wide receivers, but because I've invested in them so early, I probably should have stopped at seven on a couple of those teams. It's so funny. I, I you know, I see people all the time I, commenting on other people's teams and they're like, well, yeah, you know, you took, you took Lamar Jackson in round three, but you only have two quarterbacks. What if he gets hurt? Listen, buddy, if Lamar Jackson gets hurt. We're dead anyways. All right. So, so let's not, let's not, let's not worry about it. Okay. If we use a third round pick on Lamar Jackson, he gets hurt. He's out for the year. Forget it. Uh, it's over anyway, so don't worry about it. 
the one final. Thing here is, one thing I'll add here as well is quantity does not always make up for quality. And it really varies by different positions. In my opinion, at running back and tight end, quantity can make up for quality based off how those positions are, how you kind of role plays, injuries and such. At QB and wide receiver, it is very difficult for quantity to make up for quality. And so draft with that in mind. That doesn't mean you have to spend for the elite QBs, but when you are drafting QB, maybe be thinking about how do you find that next Justin Fields? How do you find that player that's going up, whether it was Daniel Jones last year and such, that maybe has the ability to get to that high level of quality because you're probably not going to make up for that by just drafting in quantity three late QBs. Yeah, totally agree. Okay. The final one is the most controversial one and the, and the topic that sparked this entire show, this entire series, this entire tweet, this entire article, week 17 stacking. And for those of you who are not familiar with what we're talking about here, because of the way, specifically underdog and DraftKings as well, and we're going to get to more specifics on these when we go uh, site by site, everything comes down to week 17. And I say that with no irony whatsoever. If you drafted Justin Jefferson and Josh Jacobs last year, congratulations, you won dust in best ball, L- literal dust. And so it's a counterintuitive thing for people to think, how am I going to beat 600,000, a million entries to get to a final? And then if I get there, now I also need to have game stacked. I mean, we're asking, I think a lot here out of our teams. That said, if you do get there, you have to be aware that these are big finals. Uh, DraftKings is like 1,100 people or something. Underdog is 400 and something. People, these are big finals. And so anybody who's played DFS understands how game stacking can work. So this is a very controversial topic, Leone. I don't want to go too, too, too far into the weeds here. Justin and I both agreed that so this will be the last thing we think about when we're on the clock of the things we already talked about. You might disagree a little bit here. I give you the floor let's let's try not to let's try to keep it civil in the week no toxicity in the week 17 debates i mean i would have it probably in the same level as regular stacking i would just have it all together in the sense that you know if i can get a correlated piece that fits into my positional allocation and it's after adp i'm going to take it whether that's a team stack or an opponent bring back in these tournaments that are top heavy in week 17 and it's i understand why it's difficult for people to understand it seems insane right it seems bad shit crazy to be like oh we're gonna stack for week 17 when you gotta be all these people just to get there in the first place you know 99 percent of the time your stack you're not even going to see it play out whereas if you're playing the millie maker on DraftKings on a given week you know you stack for upside and you get to see that stack even though it's improbable for you to win it's easier for people to make that straight line visualization but the truth is when you do the math on you know, the expected value, if you increase your potential of winning a 470 person field or a 1000 person field by game stacking, and you do increase that by like as much as 50% by having multiple game stacks, it has a huge increase on your expected value. Whether you get there or not is kind of immaterial. Um, so it's, it's pretty important. I do think these things happen you know, just due to randomness more than you'd expect anyways. Like I drafted five teams before the schedule came out and four of them had week 17 game stacks, a couple of them like huge game stacks. Only one of them had no game stacks. So it's my thing is like, I just don't think it's that hard to do. I think it's made to be complicated. There are some people that out of the gate when they're drafting, they're trying to set up a specific stack. I am not one of those people, but I think if you're flexible enough, and I'm pretty flexible because I really like getting ADP value. There's going to be ways for you to get that correlation. You know, if you drafted a Herbert stack, um, you know, we're ahead of ADP on Keenan Allen. And if you drafted a Herbert Keenan Allen at the four or five turn, maybe someone like Cortland Sutton, who we like a little bit better than ADP, you're going to, in the back of your mind, know like, oh, I'm probably going to take that player because the Chargers in Denver play week 17. And it's not going to change my roster construction or anything. It's just, I'm going to take him over a similarly ranked receiver at that point in time. Yeah, I think the part that got me tilted is people are coming out of the gate with a plan to not do anything as we just talked about in this episode with the plan to just stack week 17. And that to me, that is where people run awry when they're just going massively out of their way. And it's going to change ADP also. I mean, maybe you guys disagree, but so many people are talking about this now. I think that like Chiefs and Bills players, I'm sorry, Bengals and Bills players or whatever the week 17 matches with. I, 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 I actually have I actually people. have sex, so, so I don't I'm so upset that you can't even get the, <laughs> the 
<laughs> but I do think the ADPs change a little bit, but that's again where I think you start the foundation of your draft. It's the same thing with positions that for me as it is with stacking, right? Like I'm not necessarily coming out of the gate saying I'm going to draft RB heavy or wide receiver heavy. You know, I'm going to try and use my player takes and my ADP values early. I start to get that foundation. And from there, and so if the KC Cincinnati ADPs get pushed up way too much early, I might not have that stack. Just like in right. DFS, you might have to fade something and it might be a scary fade. And if it goes off, you lose. Uh, you're just going to have to accept certain things. There are other people I know draft differently. Like they're going to want to figure out a way to get that. Um, but I did find in my research that like, if you have six to nine players that are game stacked for week 17 is sort of the optimal range. And that's kind of a, total of same team pass catchers and opposition skill players all right justin I go hate, ahead i hate that i have to push back on leone because i am all on team 17 i mean week 17 my initial best ball mania team had a uh final week correlation i think it was uh matt ryan julio and kelsey but the one thing i need to push back on is there's a specific reason why this is the top of the pyramid and not part of the stacking area because I think there is a common misconception that, okay, stacking week 17 is just as important as stacking my actual core team. But when we look at the importance of an advance rate on all the data, like if you look at Leone's manifesto, you can see advance rate is extremely um, important when we're talking about the actual ROI and the EV of your team. And if you're choosing between stacking a player on your you know, QB wide receiver of the same team or the week 17 bring back, always not okay sorry not always almost always you got to lean towards your actual stack because that stack is helping you in the regular season it's helping you in the first week of the playoffs the second week of the playoffs and then it still helps you in the third week in the week 17. week 17 is helping you in just week 17. granted that's where all the money is and it's still very important but if i'm going to try to say hey what is more important or how much more important is one your actual stacking is substantially more important in my mind than week 17. None of that means don't do week 17. I'm still very, very much on week 17. I'm yeah. literally trying to create as many, many correlation stacks as possible there. But I just needed to clarify that. I don't think any of us disagree that week 17 stacking is massively. And Leon has quantified it. I mean, he just said 50% almost in, in expected value when you when you stack your week 17. You know, and I, I don't disagree yeah. with the data at all. The, the point that I think uh, you would like, Adam, and that I looked at is people do kind of want to say, I don't care how many teams I get there into the playoffs. I just want to optimize for, for when I get there, but about a 40% increase in your finals win rate is equivalent to like a 10% increase increase in your advanced rate of just out of the regular season, because your advanced rate out of the regular season, when you do the math on those really small odds of winning all those individual playoff weeks matters a ton. So um, if you can increase your advance rate in the regular season by 10%, that's just as good as increasing your finals win rate by 40%. So right. um, you do want to do both. So Yeah. And, and that's, the, that's the thing about what your goal is. Your goal to win the tournament is your goal to advance. If you guys remember, I did that 20 drafts at the same time thing last year on Underdog. And I actually had a really good advance rate. Like I advanced a ton of those teams because our rankings were good. And I was just drafting off our rankings effectively. I didn't have any correlation. I didn't have any stacking. My roster construction was kind of messy. And so like, when I got to the playoffs, I was dead. I don't think I advanced a single team of those out of that round. So in other words, like, what did I win? Nothing. Like, I, I lost because I wasn't optimized for the playoff rounds. And that's really where all the money is. So again, I'd encourage people to think about their goals for sure. All right. I think this was extremely helpful. Hope you guys enjoyed it. This is part one of our six-part best ball series. Highly encourage everyone for more on this to read Justin's article. It's just called on the clock. You can find it in the best ball section on the site. If you have draft kit pro Leone's manifesto is also up. You can carve yourself about three hours to sit down and have a nice fine read through Leone's best ball man of festo. Leone, uh, I'm sorry. Herzig is also doing twice weekly streams of best ball drafts on our YouTube channel. Head to establish the runs YouTube channel. Be sure you hit subscribe there. Herzig is grinding it all summer there with a bunch of good guests. The only tell the people where they can find you on the Twitter machine before we get out of here. Uh, you're on mute, but you can find him at Leone M. Herzig, go ahead. Leone is banned. It's, it's not ahead. at Leone M. It's at two hats, one mic. 
<laughs> at, at two hats, one mic. Same thing. Herzig, go ahead. I had Justin Herzig. Some of us prefer to just, you know, use our name. Seriously, I just had a talk with Cody about this. Uh, you have to have your name and you have to have it on every social media platform the same. Leone is going to be reprimanded by corporate after this show. For Leone, for Herzig, for producer Luke, I am Adam. We'll be back for part two.